before we dive in, um, I would love to start with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, Bloom Impact Investing acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon and welcome. Um, my name is Camille, I am the host um, for today and I am the founder of Bloom Impact Investing. So, um, I, um, let me tell you a little bit about this group before we dive in. So at Bloom, we are focusing on the impact money can have in the fight against climate change. We are on a mission to make impact investing easy and, and accessible. Part of this mission is to offer educational opportunities like these webinars to propel the voices of impact investing and sustainable finance experts far and wide. Since early this year, we have hosted several webinars, talked about climate financial risk, how to measure impact, how to invest during the COVID-19 crisis. We've talked about impact investing trends. And last week, we had a great discussion about natural capital. The aim of our webinars is to bring a community of impact investors and agents of change together so that we build so that we can build a greener, more circular and inclusive economy. You see, at Bloom, we see a world where people don't have to choose between doing well and doing good. And today we are in for a treat because we, we have the founder and director of our of Future Super, Adam Verwey. We will be discussing how our super can make a positive impact and, um, and we have the privilege to have Adam walk us through um, this topic. Quick housekeeping, um, please note this event is being recorded um, and the recording will be made available to the attendees after the event. But fear not, unless you unmute yourself and speak, your video won't show on the recording. So don't be shy and let Adam and myself see your beautiful smile today. Please note the information, a little bit of a disclaimer, I have to. Um, please note the information provided in this webinar will be general in nature only and does not constitute personal financial advice. The information has been prepared without taking into account your personal objectives, financial situations or needs. Before acting on any information from this presentation, you should consider your personal situation and whether um, it's appropriate for you or not. So finally, please note that this is a safe space. So you can ask any questions throughout the event by typing in the chat. And please um, feel free to indicate whether you would like me to ask the question on your behalf. We will keep 15 minutes at the end of the event for Q&As. But before we dive in, please let me introduce our speaker today, Adam, and tell you a few words about Future Super. So a little bit about Adam. Adam is the founder and managing director at Future Super, Australia's first 100% fossil fuel free superannuation fund. Future Super has grown a lot since its inception and is now managing close to 1.5 billion in fund under management. Adam has a long history in ethical investment with expertise in superannuation, ESG, which stands for environmental, social and governance, research, corporate campaigning, and constructing ethical share market and indices. He's the managing director responsible for investment management, impact and advocacy. But what you need to know about Adam is that prior to founding Future Super, he was already a rock star in the field of ethical investing. He had spent almost 10 years at Australian Ethical Investment as a senior manager in business development and marketing. He's, an, he's now a director at the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, an organisation dedicated to shareholder advocacy, which is so important, and engagement. Adam is also the portfolio manager for the Thomson Reuters Australian Fossil Fuel Free Index and a member of the Responsible Investment Committee 
for the Better Shares Sustainability ETFs, and ETF stands for Exchange Traded Bonds. Now, I suspect some of you today might think that superannuation, the, the superannuation industry is a bit boring. But um, Adam will shortly prove us otherwise. And um, what I could gather from Future Super's uh, 2019 impact report um, tells me that life at Future Super hasn't been so boring lately. And here are three quick facts I would love to share with you all today. So the first one is through members choosing to roll their superannuation into um, and keep their superannuation with Future Super. Future Super has estimated stopping 50 million, 50 million from being invested directly into fossil fuels since its inception. In September, second fact, in September 2019, well, when children all over the world started to skip school to get adults to pay attention to the climate crisis, Future Super launched the campaign, Not Business as Usual. Do you remember? encouraging business leaders around the world to go to the first global climate strike. They just thought that no employee should have to choose between a paycheck and the planet. And they, um, they launched an alliance of businesses pledging to support employees to strike, the Not Business As Usual Alliance. The campaign launched nationally, but had a global impact. And I think got retreated by Greta. <laughs> In, in other, amongst other things. And finally, last fact, um, in May 2019, Future Super became the first super fund to exclude investment in any listed company that only had men on their board of directors. I think that deserves a little clap. So enough of me talking. Uh, with that in mind, um, it is with great pleasure that I invite Adam um, to share Future Super's journey with us today um, and tell us more about how our super can really make a difference. So Adam, over to you. I will invite you to share unless you are able to share your screen now. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm not able to share my screen just okay. yet. I'll invite you, give me a second. Um, uh, that was a great, um, that was a great introduction. That's the first time I've been described as a rock star in any way <laughs> at all. Uh, Look, superannuation is a tough sell. You have to make it <laughs> engaging. So, yeah, great. And I've, um, I've also noticed that um, our head of impact, uh, Emily uh, Flood, has uh, is on the line as well. So, if people have really detailed questions about how we think about um, impact and the frameworks we use, um, then uh, I might just defer to her on some of those questions um, as well. Right. Excellent. So, um, and so just one, um, I mean, it's also um, really great that Camille gave the general advice disclaimer, but I usually have to give at the start of um, presentations. Uh, and the only other thing I add to it is just, um, uh, I will talk a little bit about financial returns in this and just, um, just know that past performance is no guarantee of uh, future performance. Um, there's actually a, a heap um, that we could talk about and I've prepared a whole bunch of slides but I really do want to leave a heap of time at the end uh, to uh, answer any questions. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about future super a lot um, but um, mostly as a way of sort of showing how we've uh, changed how we think about uh, impact over our, um, over our few years that we've uh, existed. Uh, and, but actually I'm going to start by just talking about myself <laughs> and sort of talk about sort of why this is an industry I work in and why I think um, superannuation plays an important role in terms of making the impacts that we, um, that we really want to have. Um, and so, uh, so what you can see on the screen right now is a, a picture uh, taken on top of um, the mine uh, in the middle of Broken Hill. So um, when I was uh, in high school, my family moved to, to Broken Hill. Uh, which, if you've ever been there, is sort of a, a bit of an interesting town in many ways, but in, particularly interesting because this mine uh, lies just right in the middle of town. So uh, what you're looking at there from the top of the mine is a view of the main street. So uh, if you're uh, in town having a coffee at a cafe, there's a good chance that that cafe 
is right there, right on the edge of right on the edge of the mine, um, which obviously uh, creates um, sort of a sort of a strange vibe. You don't get that in many towns. Uh, but one of the things uh, that's not particularly great about having a huge mine like this in the middle of town, and it's a mine um, that uh, produces lead, zinc, uh, and so on, is that this isn't a naturally occurring hill you see there. This is all the tailings that have been brought up from underneath the ground, and this has a whole bunch of lead in it. So uh, what you really have is a huge pile of lead right in the middle of where everybody lives. Uh, and lead can have a really uh, devastating impact on people's uh, development. So if you grow up, if you're a child who, who was born in Broken Hill in particular, there's a very good chance you have elevated levels of lead in your blood. And that, that's going to cause you a lot of learning difficulties. It might cause you a lot of problems throughout your life. It's a really devastating thing uh, to have. So, uh, so that exists in the middle of, uh, right in the middle of town. And it's also a mine where, um, you know, like mining conditions aren't great. There's been over 100 deaths in that mine uh, since uh, it was launched. And, you know, when you're in a town the size of Broken Hill, you know, that's a very impactful thing to happen in your town. And then I guess when I was in high school in Broken Hill, you sort of see this and you experience it and you know kids who have got, uh, and families who've got real problems as a result of um, this lead uh, sitting here. And you sort of think and hope that, um, that the contribution of this town was for the common good, right? Like, so that the, the suffering that the people in the town have is somehow uh, sort of has a, an overall net positive impact for everybody else uh, and that the, the wealth that was produced in Broken Hill was shared. Uh, except, uh, I guess, towards the end of my time in high school, I sort of had this moment, as did some of the others in, in my class, that uh, this wealth wasn't shared around. Um, in fact, uh, we realised that the BH in BHP Billiton stands for Broken Hill uh, and that uh, BHP, Australia's biggest um, company in Australia at the time, one of the world's biggest companies, uh, had its foundations in Broken Hill and was the cause of a lot of suffering there and made a lot of profit from it. This wasn't for the Commonwealth. A lot of people, uh, uh, well, a few individuals profited a lot from the poisoning of children uh, in the town I grew up in, uh, which is a pretty hard thing to sort of think about when you're in high school, you feel very powerless. Uh, I moved away um, and went to uh, went and lived in Canberra after I finished high school, uh, and sort of my experience of living in a town where a company had done this uh, sort of led me into activism. I got into student unionism. Uh, I found sort of an outlet um, for some of this, you know, uh, anger uh, from this uh, there, and um, and while I was in the student unions. Uh, had a group of students lobby um, my student association uh, around where it was investing uh, its money. Uh, so we looked at where the, super, uh, the student association was investing its money, found it wasn't invested in an ethical way, uh, did our research and then switched to a, an ethical investment manager for the student association funds, uh, which happened to be a company called Australian Ethical Investment um, who had its office literally across the road from our university. Um, so, um, which is quite unusual in Canberra, there's no funds management industry and yet the one funds management uh, company in town was this ethical investment manager um, right across the road. And at the same time, it made me think, well, um, what am I invested in? Like I'm a poor uni student, but I must have some investments. Uh, and I looked into my um, superannuation. I had a REST superannuation account. Um, when I looked into the holdings, found that my, um, my largest holding was in BHP. Uh, so I was very motivated to uh, move my money. I, so I moved my own superannuation at the time. Felt amazing that I'd moved my money out of this company, but I really, really hated it. It was just, uh, sort of an ethical decision for me. Uh, you know, my superannuation balance at the time probably wasn't even big enough to buy one entire BHP share, but still the, the, the feeling of moving that money uh, felt very impactful to me. Um, and so impactful, in fact, that I... Um, I applied for a job at Australian Ethical Superannuation at the same time uh, and uh, uh, was lucky enough to get it and started working there back in um, sort of 2005. Uh, and uh, it was really good. I mean, Australian Ethical at the time only had a few hundred million uh, funds under management and now has four billion funds under management. It's been an amazing growth story um, for them. Um, but during my 10 years there, even though it was growing it felt like it was growing fast. It felt like it just really wasn't bridging the gap in terms of how many people say that they want to invest in a way that aligns with their ethics 
and how many people actually do that. And I think part of the problem there was that people were switching their superannuation the exact same way I did, which was I was in my uh, alone in my dorm room at a, at a university, I switched it and I just didn't tell anybody about it. So even though I really felt great about making that move, uh, I didn't talk to my friends and talk to my family uh, about it and just did it as a move in isolation. This was, this was something that I did because I was an ethical consumer and all I was doing was making a, a consumer decision to, to move my money, um, but not a movement based um, decision. Um, so, uh, so after many years at Australian Ethical, um, around 2013, uh, two things happened to me. Um, one was I got really um, quite actively involved in the fossil fuel divestment movement, uh, which was really uh, sort of building up at the time, uh, not just in Australia, but, but globally, um, and found that I, I could play an important role within that movement, uh, helping people to talk about investment and finances. And the other thing that happened to me uh, at the same time uh, was that I, uh, put my hand up to run uh, as one of those Greens candidates who knows they're probably not going to get elected um, uh, at the federal election in 2013, but could help somebody else who has a chance. Uh, and in this case, uh, it was a guy called Simon who was running uh, for the um, Senate in the ACT and really motivated because in 2013, uh, there was a chance that Tony Abbott was going to be our prime minister and the thought of having a climate change denying prime minister uh, who could wind back a lot of the work we, uh, that had just been taken on climate change by the previous government uh, was frightening enough. So frightening enough that I put up my hand to uh, go out every weekend and door knock and do all those different things. Um, but one of the great things to come at it for, for me was um, the experience of seeing some amazing community organising. Uh, so Simon, um, who ended up being my co-founder at Future Super, had just finished up at Get Up. Uh, and came to the ACT and took a group of uh, Greens where uh, there was about a dozen reliable volunteers and got a thousand people to volunteer on his campaign. Just really amazing. And just seeing the way he could uh, recruit people to really care and take an interest uh, and build a movement was amazing to see. Uh, and uh, unfortunately he missed out uh, on getting elected by just a couple hundred votes. So bad for Simon, great for me, because I got to start a business with Simon which was thinking, how do we take, uh, you know, what Simon knew about community organising and movement building, and how do we apply that to, uh, to superannuation? And in particular, how do we apply it in a way that helps create the change we want to see on climate change that motivated us to run in an election? Um, uh, so, uh, so not long after, um, so not long after that election, we started uh, building Future Super. Um, really motivated by the, the size of the opportunity. So if we thought we could make a real impact um, through, uh, through politics, well, there was another way we could make impact, which is superannuation had at the time $2 trillion in funds under management. Uh, there's now closer to $3 trillion in our superannuation accounts. And it plays such a, when you have money of that uh, size, it plays a huge role in what sort of activities get funded and which ones don't. Um, and at the time, 55% of superannuation was invested in uh, fossil fuels or high carbon assets, and just 2% was invested in renewables and low carbon assets. So being able to switch the way $2 trillion was invested could have a significant impact on the flow of capital. And um, really, uh, you know, despite the fact we had a climate change denying prime minister could help bypass that uh, and uh, help sort of still create the, the change on climate that we wanted to see. So, uh, so it took us about a year to get the fund up and running. So um, this was uh, on our day of launch. So obviously we built it and people, uh, people came <laughs> to sign up. Uh, and this was actually one of the, uh, we launched it right at the time of uh, some of the, the initial big climate marches um, that were happening. Uh, and the next slide, and hopefully this is gonna work well, is just a clip from Late Line, which I think sort of really describes at the time how we were thinking about impact uh, and our role that we would um, play in it. And fingers crossed that you're all gonna um, hear this video as it plays as well. Here too, demonstrators have rallied in the capitals. Although Australians are increasingly motivated to hit the streets on the issue of climate change, the question is how many of these people are prepared to put their money where their mouths are? 
Yeah, yeah g'day. Hey. Funny, Simon yeah. Shake, yeah. founder of the activist organisation yeah. GetUp, is betting many will. Yeah. Well, we'd love to have you as a member if you'd consider joining. Yeah. Cheers. His new venture, Future Super, is promoted as the first Australian fund not to invest directly in oil, coal and gas or in the companies servicing and financing the sector. Our biggest contribution to climate change is in our savings and in our home loans, not the lights we choose or the electric vehicles we might choose to drive. Those things are important, but it's our money that's driving carbon pollution. In two weeks, the fund says it signed up 500 members. John Knox switched a quarter of a million dollars in retirement savings into it, and he says not just to help the planet. This could be uh, considered just something that I'm doing to protect my own investment as well, because when the world actually acts on, on climate change, the fossil fuel companies are not going to be able to sell their product. And because of that, their share values are going to go down is what he's going to say next. <laughs> um, I always regret that five years ago, we didn't record two more seconds <laughs> of that clip. Um, so I think that gives a good insight into how we thought about uh, impact at the time. So there was this fossil fuel divestment movement um, that was really building up. Uh, and in Australia, people could switch their banking to a fossil free bank, uh, like Bank Australia, Bendigo Bank. Uh, they could switch their energy to a 100% renewable energy uh, provider, like, like a power shop. Uh, but they had nowhere to put their money in their superannuation that was 100% fossil fuel free. Their only choices at the time were to put their money into funds that still funded uh, fossil fuels. So when we thought about, you know, what is the greatest impact we could have as a super fund? Well, it was being just sort of existing and being a fund that people could move into uh, and playing a role to sort of help um, the activists who were pressuring their funds. Because what was really helpful for those activists, particularly the ones who were working through 350 or climate action groups uh, or market forces, was when they were pressuring super funds, they needed to show that there was a place that their members could move to if their demands around climate action weren't listened to. And so we felt that we could play a really important role in terms of being that super fund people, um, people could move to. Uh, um, and, and, and obviously the side, this, this is just to talk about the size of super. Um, I forgot this slide was in here, um, you know, Thinking about the size of super and how much how much influence someone like Gina Reinhart has, well, there's 200 Gina Reinharts um, in uh, in Australia's superannuation accounts. Um, but in terms of um, that action that was being taken, so this is an example. So we actually saw that there were, we had quite an immediate impact in that role that we were trying to have to be the super fund that could help uh, activists really lift um, lift their activism and and their advocacy at super funds. Um, so. Uh, in this picture, you know, like pick which one is the Vision Super staff member. <laughs> it's um, it's the guy in the middle joyously receiving this petition from his um, from members of his fund. So here we had a, a group of members of Vision Super who were lobbying um, Vision Super to do better on climate. Uh, you know, Vision Super is a large industry fund. They invest a lot of money. The impact they have with that money is large, and and this group of um, their members had been campaigning them for a long time. Um, and uh, one of the key points of difference in having Vision Super actually change what they were doing uh, was when Future Super launched, some of their members started moving to us. So it went from them getting uh, pestered by the activists within their fund to those activists then deciding to move and encouraging other people to move uh, to us as well. Uh, and the action was pretty swift. So as an example here, uh, only about two dozen members switched from Vision Super to Future Super um, before the Vision Super CEO started phoning up those members who were switching to try to talk to them um, uh, at, about their decision. Um, and uh, not long after that, uh, they launched uh, sort of a super low fee and genuinely really ethical product, uh, which is really great, which is exactly what the members are asking for. Um, so, you know, Future Super can't really take any credit for that beyond just existing and giving a place to those members to go to help uplift their activism. Uh, but, you know, it, it was an important part of um, what was going on there. Um, we also saw some other uh, super funds make it changes around the time. Uh, a lot of ethical funds started to get a lot more strict around fossil fuels. Um, a lot of other big industry funds either created or really improved their sustainable or ethical options, although unfortunately still to date, they haven't uh, incorporated ethics into their default uh, options, which is um, disappointing. Um, 
And so we, and, and we had super fun trustees uh, come out and pretty much validate that um, the work of the activists in these areas was working. So there was one super fun trustee who said at a conference um, around 2014 or 2015, but we're receiving as few as seven letters from members around climate change felt like a, a, a tsunami of, uh, of letters and, and engagement. So, um, so it sort of shows how important it is uh, when you're seeking to make impact, but you, you let people know uh, the actions you're taking and why you're taking them and don't do what I did when I switched, which was just uh, switched out of rest and didn't say anything to them. I was just one more person that day who switched funds for whatever, um, whatever reason. Uh, so that sort of um, was how we thought about our impact at the time. And over the last um, six years, we've um, sort of changed the way we think about the role we play. So one thing is we got bigger. Uh, we now have around 20,000 people who've chosen to invest with us. And we think uh, we have a, a sort of an obligation to think about impact differently. So not just um, be someone who uh, sort of leverages other people's impacts, but helps create impacts ourselves a lot more. And the way we think about that is incorporated into our mission, which is to, to lead the movement, to use the power of money to invest, advocate and campaign for a future work retiring into. And so we think about impact through those three lenses of investment, advocacy and campaigning. Uh, and sort of broken down into um, their different areas here. Um, and, you know, this is really how all super funds should be thinking about uh, how they have their impacts. So when we think about the impact of how we invest, we're thinking about what are, what are the negative screens? What are we choosing to uh, avoid investing in? What are our positive screens? You know, where are we actively looking to invest money? What are our impact investments? So how are we, uh, what are the things we can invest in that have a really direct uh, impact uh, and help create uh, new positive impacts, particularly in areas of climate change and inequality? And we think there's a role we can play in helping to unlock other money uh, to invest like we do as well. So if we can help bring new product to market or seed new products, then it gives people an, uh, an avenue to invest in the same ways that we do. When we think about our advocacy, uh, we think, you know, if we're a, a shareholder in companies then we should be an active shareholder, we should engage with those companies about their performance. We should make sure that we uh, vote our shares at their company general meetings. And we should talk to companies about what it means to uh, show best practice uh, in their communities. And we think we also have a role not just as a super fund, but as a business in terms of uh, leading campaigns and showing what it means to be a, a ethical and impactful business as well. So, uh, so I might just break that down into uh, a bit more detail and focus on uh, how we invest first. So uh, how we invest in terms of negative and positive screening looks quite a bit like what a typical ethical fund uh, would do. So most ethical funds or sustainable funds have some sort of version of this, which is they have areas that they want to exclude, areas that they want to support. And usually this is done mostly around listed shares. Um, so, so we have our version of this and we tend to be quite strict around the individual criteria. Other ethical funds do as well. Some uh, have the same uh, exclusions, but maybe not quite as strict uh, in terms of their threshold. And, um, and with us, uh, we think it's important, well, when you join most super funds, you get a choice between a balanced fund, a growth fund, a conservative fund, and it's sort of split up around in terms of risk. Uh, whereas we've sort of thought about, well, why don't we uh, get our members to choose rather than between uh, different risk, different types of impact they want to uh, create. So uh, we have a, an indexed option, which mostly just invest in um, listed companies and uh, liquid bonds, which has positive and negative screening. Uh, but doesn't seek out any particular impact investings in the por investments in the portfolio. So if you just want a, a great ethically screened product um, at a lower fee, uh, then that would be something that our members could choose. Or you could choose to focus uh, your impact through one of our other options, such as we have an option um, that invests uh, a lot in uh, renewable energy, 20% of the portfolio in renewable energy, and another one that sort of looks at both uh, renewable energy and um, also things like social impacts and inequalities as well. Uh, what we find is uh, about 60% of people choose the renewables option when they get to choose their impact with us. And very few people choose to just get the uh, indexed option without the impact. Um, so that's been an interesting thing for us seeing that uh, although you've got to pay more to have the impact um, through the fees, uh, that most of our members choose to choose to do that. Uh, and the result of that screening, uh, and Camille mentioned this in the uh, introduction, 
is that the carbon impact of switching to our fund or to other ethical funds as well ends up being one of the more impactful things you can do. So, um, so it's not sort of saying that uh, you know going vegan or not driving car aren't important actions to take, but in terms of the size of our carbon impact, uh, switching to an ethical fund and in particular avoiding fossil fuels for your investments uh, becomes a really uh, sort of important uh, action to take. And then on the positive side, what we know is we've almost $3 trillion in superannuation now and projected to increase to $9 trillion, that the opportunity for super funds to positively invest that money, uh, particularly into uh, clean energy, can make a huge difference. So just 7.7% .7 of the money that's invested in our superannuation could fund a 100% renewable uh, clean energy grid in Australia by the year 2030. Uh, so there's an important role superannuation funds can play in terms of funding, uh, funding that transition. Um, and then sort of, uh, you know, some people unfortunately still think there might be a trade-off in terms of performance when joining an ethical fund. This is uh, research from a Responsible Investment Association of Australia and their benchmarking report, which shows that, you know, the average ethical or responsible investment fund has done just as well as and frequently does better than what the standard uh, ethical fund has done. Uh, and, uh, and most of the time that our performance over the, uh, of the responsible funds comes in uh, moments like we've had now, which is a moment of downturn. So you see a lot of our performance generally uh, when share markets are not doing great, which is because, you know, on one hand, uh, if you exclude the ethics or the values that, um, result in a super fund wanting to invest like ours does it's also a way of just removing a lot of risks from your portfolio and so uh, you're removing environmental risks social risk governance risks and also the risk that companies will lose the social license to operate uh, and so when that um, so when there's down markets uh, and a lot of those risks play out if you've reduced your risks in your portfolio then you tend to do better uh, there are uh, obviously some clear risks, particularly around climate, um, that are worth considering. And we uh, often think about stranded asset risk as a future risk, although it is playing out um, right now. Um, so when we think about super funds and how they invest right now, they still invest quite heavily into uh, carbon. Uh, and uh, what we know is that there is a lot more carbon on the books of fossil fuel companies uh, than what we can burn uh, if we want to stay uh, below two degrees Celsius of global warming. So uh, there's clearly a trade-off here where we either um, burn all, all that carbon that's on the books of fossil fuel companies and allow them to unlock uh, the profits from that, or we choose to restrict what they can burn and, and restrict the profits that fossil fuel companies uh, can generate. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's a future, you know, we sort of think about it as a futurist, but it is really playing out now. Um, in terms of whether we choose to uh, have a um, more than two degrees of warming or not. Uh, and then on, the, on sort of the another way to look at uh, climate risk when it comes to carbons in portfolio, and, and I apologize, these are not the most easy to read charts and I'll try uh, to explain them. But, uh, but on the left uh, is, a, uh, is a, a table showing the performance of a group of uh, climate leaders versus a group of climate laggards. Um, when it comes to financial performance and shows that a company that is a climate leader has outperformed climate laggards over all time periods. And that's not uh, renewable companies versus fossil fuel companies. That's about the carbon uh, a company generates in its normal operations. So that includes um, banks, uh, energy companies, industrial companies, consumer companies, whatever it is. Uh, the companies in those industries which do better on their own carbon uh, do better financially or have done better financially than companies who are not as good on those criteria. And if we look on the right, um, which is a more um, confusing plot chart, uh, the darker blue uh, dots on that chart are the climate leaders. Uh, and uh, where you want to be on that uh, particular plot chart is in the bottom right hand corner. Because what that says is that you've generated uh, outperformance over that period and you've done it at a lower level of risk. So if we sort of think about how, uh, you know, taking account of things like carbon in a portfolio plays out, well, uh, historically, uh, it's shown that uh, it'll produce superior returns and at a lower level of risk than, uh, than what more carbon intensive companies have done.
And so, so carbon clearly has a financial impact. There are some other ethical issues which clearly have a financial impact on companies as well. Um, one of the other areas where this is quite clear to see is around gender diversity in companies time and again. And there was some new research that came out just the other day uh, showing that companies that have more diversity uh, in their uh, operations uh, just do better financially uh, as well. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why we uh, made the moves to remove all, um, all male boards, uh, companies of all male boards from our portfolios over the last few years. Uh, so that's sort of a little bit about how we invest. I actually want to talk a little bit more about sort of um, the financial side of things a little bit later, particularly in terms of fossil fuels. But um, just in terms of how we think about impact outside of how we invest money, we also think about it in terms of how we act as uh, an advocate for our members into the companies uh, they invest in. So one of the campaigns uh, our team ran last year was around um, equality, gender equality in companies, and particularly at the companies within the ASX 100. So the 100 largest companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Uh, and part of that was, to, you know, the starting point for that uh, engagement was to plot how Australia's largest companies are doing right now in terms of gender equality. So uh, on, a, on a range of criteria, this is how uh, we plotted them out. Um, so we haven't identified all the different companies on this particular plot chart, but you can see here that uh, on the, on the left-hand side, TPG Telecom was uh, one of the worst performers, also one of the few ASX 100 companies that still has no uh, woman on their board of directors. And then on uh, the right-hand side, we see Stockland as one of the, the better performers. Our approach here was to say, well, um, this is a spectrum and nobody's doing 100%. So we can engage with all of these companies and ask them to do at least one thing better than what they're doing now. And so, uh, so we feel like there's a, not a great chance of success of talking to someone like TPG and telling them to immediately be as good as Stockland, but you can ask them to take the next step, uh, next step along. So our team put together um, a, a seven different asks that they could make of companies and identified which ones they thought were the next best step for them to take. Um, they contacted those different companies uh, and said that they were not just engaging and making this request, but they were going to uh, make public uh, that the engagement was happening and the results of that engagement. Um, this is quite a bit different to how most super funds do engagement. So most super funds will do engagement in a not very transparent way, um, in part because um, they believe uh, that if they had to do this in a public way, it might restrict their access to boardrooms and to executives at those companies. Uh, Whereas our view is we think it's unlikely you'll get a result from your engagement unless uh, you uh, sort of create a, a carrot and a stick in terms of um, the opportunity for a company to be seen to be do doing well and, a uh, you know, uh, sorry, a carrot and, that ca and then the stick of, you know, hitting them over the head if they uh, don't take any action. So we our team reached out to 100 companies. Uh, this is just a snapshot of how we chose to report on this as well. Um, and you can see some examples of the arcs that we made here. Um, so out of those 100 companies, uh, we had seven companies uh, chose to make a commitment to do better on gender equality. Uh, you can see a couple of those on this page. So Medibank Private was one of those, uh, you know, uh, making a commitment to publish data on uh, their gender pay gap. Uh, Transurban Group, um, making uh, paid parental leave available to all staff. Um, you know, those, those are really important things and very impactful things because those companies have a lot of staff. So if we're talking about the impact that we can have, having seven companies with hundreds, thousands uh, of staff members uh, getting um, a better deal from their employer around gender equality is, is a sort of a very impactful action to take. One of the other interesting things we found was uh, our chances of success with this engagement didn't seem to relate to whether we were an investor in the company. Um, so some of these companies like Medibank, we are an investor in, um, but we also saw that a company like Aristocrat, which makes poker machines, uh, also made a commitment when we reached out to engage um, with them. So they made a commitment to sign up to the uh, Wajia pledge. Um, so, um, so that was a really interesting thing for us to see that we could have impact uh, through um, engaging in this way without even needing to be an investor in that particular company. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the third way we think about impact is how do we, um, how do we make impact as a business and how do we uh, sort of Show, um, show that we can lead the way in terms of uh, business uh, having impact. Uh, and uh, Camille mentioned this one in, in the introduction. 
Uh, but last year we were thinking about um, in the lead up to the uh, students um, climate march, the global climate marches last year, uh, how we could have uh, an impact on that event. So usually what we would do and what most companies do when there's a big event coming up, whether it's a climate march or um, you know, something like uh, the Mardi Gras, is you just start doing a lot of branding around it and you uh, look to associate your brand with that event and just sign up lots of people at it. Um, and you would have seen from that ABC late line video I showed earlier, we used to do the same. We used to turn up to climate marches and just sign people up to it. We weren't increasing the impact of the event. We were beneficiaries of the event. And so we were thinking, well, how could we actually um, help create impact at those events rather than just sign people up? And so, uh, so our team thought, well, one of the things we could do was uh, to encourage businesses to take, uh, to allow their staff to take the day off work, in particular, to take their children um, along to those marches. Uh, we thought that we might get, um, you know, a couple of hundred businesses uh, agree to join. In the end, we had 3,000 businesses signed up to uh, the pledge to allow their staff to take time off that day. Uh, and this was one of the things credited with uh, doubling the turnout at the climate marches last year, which was a really uh, incredible uh, result. Um, and you sort of see the flow and impact from that is, so this other um, uh, clip from the financial review here, um, is that these things get noticed, right? So um, I know that I turn up to a lot of protests and you don't always see the results of that flowing through into any particular action. But when BlackRock, which is the world's largest fund manager, uh, decided to divest their active holdings from fossil fuels or from coal uh, earlier this year, they credited the turnouts at the, the climate march as one of the reasons why they took that particular, took that particular action. Um, so that's sort of how we've been thinking about um, impact that we can have. And equally, that's how all super funds could have impact. But mostly uh, when super funds are talking about impact, uh, they would be thinking about a small portion of their portfolio, perhaps a few percent, which would be a specifically invested into impact investments. Or they would be thinking about the engagement and advocacy they have. Uh, it's sort of rare for super funds right now, uh, even though you should, uh, to think about impact across that, that broad sort of all three, three ways at the same time. Um, and I'm just conscious of time, but I did also want to talk about um, the context of um, performance and particularly around fossil fuels. Um, so I might just quickly run through these, but um, what you can see on your screen now is um, the returns from July 1 last year up until the end of May. So these are the financial um, year to date. Um, and within the top 10 funds highlighted by uh, super ratings, um, most of those uh, top 10 uh, funds um, are funds which have a strict screen on fossil fuel investing. So, um, and at the same time, you can see that the medium balance fund up to this date of this year has had a negative return for the year. So most funds have produced negative returns uh, a handful of funds, less than a quarter of balance funds, have produced a positive return to this point this year. Uh, and it's not a stretch to say that the difference between a positive and negative return for your super fund in this financial year is likely to be their approach to whether they invest in fossil fuels or not. And while that's been happening this year, and I know it's been highlighted in particular by things like negative oil prices that we saw um, a few months ago, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, that fossil fuels have been deteriorating from people's returns for a, a really long time now. It just seems to be that it's been less noticeable when markets have been going up because we've still been getting positive returns anyway. So if I look at a global level, this is the, um, uh, the MISCI All World Index, which is sort of 6,000 uh, the listed global companies versus the uh, MISCI uh, All World Index energy stocks. And in this case, energy means fossil fuels. It doesn't mean renewable energy, it means specifically oil and gas companies. So over the last 10 years, uh, globally, uh, even after the latest downturn, uh, listed companies around the world have done exceptionally well. They've produced a return of positive 70%. But the fossil fuel companies around the world, the listed fossil fuel companies have produced a return of negative 30% over that same time. Uh, so that's a huge difference. It's been a deterioration of returns for a long time. If we look at the ASX, this is the largest 200 companies on the Australian Stock Exchange, uh, we're seeing this as well. The Australian Stock Exchange has gone up 50% uh, uh, over 60% over the last 10 years. The fossil fuel companies on the ASX have gone down 50%, uh, which is 
a huge difference uh, and you can see that this difference is over the, the most of the last um, 10 years. So if we think about what's really having an impact on our, our super fund returns right now, fossil fuels are having an impact. And in particular within the ASX, it's a pretty fossil fuel heavy index compared to global markets. Uh, so this makes a really big difference in terms of the returns, uh, returns we get. Uh, and if we break it down even more uh, over the last 10 years, these are three of the largest companies within uh, the ASX uh, energy uh, sector. Uh, the difference in share price uh, from 10 years ago to today is between 60 and 74% uh, for those three stocks, Woodside, Santos, Oil Search. And I guess one of the amazing things for me is, you know, none of this is particularly um, secret or unavailable information. This is information that's been available to uh, all super funds and all fund managers uh, for a long time. Uh, and so uh, it's been surprising that there hasn't been more movement up until this date in terms of divesting from fossil fuels. And obviously, up until recently, uh, our industry super funds even buying more fossil fuel assets. So it's sort of going in the face of what the returns are telling us. Um, but on the other side of that, I guess, it, particularly if I wanted to sort of give a bit of a call to action in terms of what to do, um, there has been this huge movement of financial companies, uh, so banks, insurance companies, um, who are increasingly putting restrictions on their investments in and insurance of fossil fuel projects. So, uh, you know, they might be motivated in part by the poor returns and the increasing risks in, in, this, um, in this area, or they might be worried about the social license to operate of some of these companies given the protests. But what we're seeing is that there are now uh, almost 150 large global companies who have put uh, heavy restrictions uh, on investing or insuring of fossil fuel projects. And Australia, which is a bit of a laggard, is still uh, taking action here as well. Um, but what we know as well is fossil fuel companies desperately need um, insurance and investment coming out of COVID to continue to extract fossil fuels and to uh, make a profit from fossil fuels. And so if ever there was a time when you could have really great impact from switching your money, whether it's for your super, for your banking, for your insurance or whatever, now's a time when you could really have an impact. You could really dry up uh, a fossil fuel company ability coming out of this crisis to get investment or insurance for its projects to extract more fossil fuels. Um, yeah, I've spoken a lot um, and probably spoken at 100 miles an hour, but happy to take, um, take questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, great insights. I love that you highlighted the, um, I guess, the impact, but also the financial aspects. I think the risk um, of stranded assets is often something the public um, um, doesn't really know about. So that's great that you touched on um, those topics. I have, um, I have a question for you that relates to um, the news, if you don't mind. So um, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, the government, as we all know, allowed Australians to um, withdraw their super, uh, 10,000 worth of their super. Have you seen, I was curious to know, have you seen many members dipping into their retirement savings? And um, what do you think of this initiative? Um, yeah, we have seen a few members dip into their savings. I don't think our fund has had a higher percentage than other funds. I think. Um, I think most funds have had about 10% of their members, I think, um, choose to withdraw some of their money. Uh, and then from July, uh, for people who are still um, finding it tough, that there's another opportunity for them to withdraw. Um, people, yeah, people are doing that. You can't really blame someone for taking, uh, withdrawing money from their super at a time like this. You know, a lot of people have lost work. Uh, a lot of people are, are struggling to pay rent, uh, you know, uh, feed their families, do that sort of thing. So I think, you know, if someone needs to dip into their money, then, um, you know, you can't, really, uh, you can't really talk to them about how that might not be a great financial decision over the next 40 years, right, or something like that, because, you know, these people clearly need money now. Um, but it was pretty bad policy. It was hard for super funds who are investing for the long term to then have to suddenly switch the way they invest um, to create liquidity to help pay out uh, a lot of these investments. So I think that was really tough for super funds. Um, but I think it was also bad policy um, when uh, we uh, have a government that is funding fossil fuels to the tune of subsidies. Fossil fuel companies get subsidies of around $13 billion every year. And we've just had $13 billion taken from people's super accounts, you know, pretty much the exact same amount of money. 
So in this case, you know, you could sort of arguably say the government has chosen to continue to support this industry that's uh, causing climate havoc and making people uh, dip into their superannuation and future savings instead. Thank you, Adam. That's a, that's a great summary and always good to touch on the subsidies. Um, it, it's absolutely huge. Um, we've got a great question from Maya, which I'm going to ask you now. Um, Maya asks, why are so many people still hesitating switching to ethical super, you think? Uh, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> we keep, uh, I think our team keeps trying to work out <laughs> what the answers are and helping people, helping people switch. I think one thing I've noticed um, over the years is that once people find out about um, ethical investing, uh, they usually switch. So I think um, uh, they usually switch pretty quickly. So uh, we know through Future Super's experience that the time between someone finding out about us and someone joining us is pretty short. So um, mm. you know, uh, half of our members do that within uh, two weeks. Um, so that's a really short time period. So I think there's a, uh, one of the challenges here is uh, helping people understand that their superannuation and uh, uh, the money in it has an has a impact on uh, the sort of world we live in. And then showing them that there's a way that they can have positive impacts with that money instead. I think that seems to be the biggest, um, the biggest barrier. I think some of the other barriers of switching things like technology or time sort of got solved a long time ago. You know, it used to be a real hassle to change a super fund. Uh, you used to have to do it all on paper. Now it takes two minutes. Um, so I don't think there's any sort of technological reason. I think it's more that people aren't engaged in super, so they don't know the potentially negative impacts they could be having with it. Thank you. Great, um, great answer. Um, we have a question from Philly. Um, Philip, do you mind unmuting yourself and asking Adam? Let me know if you prefer me to. Yep, go for it. Yeah, hi Adam. I was just wondering if you follow, or if you need to follow the research and in innovation into energy um, and what's proposed by the chief scientists, etc., for the future of energy in, into investment decisions, like for example, hydrogen and potential hydrogen exports from Australia? Yeah, um, good question. Yeah, I guess we think about um, our investment decisions in two different ways. So we sort of split it up into two different blocks. When we think about our investment in liquid assets like um, listed companies, um, bonds, things like that, we very much take sort of a, a rules-based approach to there. Sort of, we, we know the sort of areas we want to um, avoid. We know the areas we want to support and we sort of invest in the universe of things that fall within um, uh, that universe. So we don't really take an active stock picking approach or anything like that. We're very much trying to invest as broadly across the universe of ethical stocks as we can. And then we have a portion of our portfolio, which is specifically around creating impact on uh, climate change and inequality, uh, usually uh, around areas like investment in infrastructure, uh, particularly providing debt um, to new uh, renewable energy projects, um, things like that. Um, so in that case, we're sort of looking for opportunities. I mean, I think um, what we sort of rely on is uh, managers, uh, you know, and people who are creating new projects coming to us with an opportunity that's investable um, for a super fund. I don't recall being approached, for instance, on anything to do with hydrogen so far. Um, and, but mostly our investments in, to this stage have been in uh, small to mid-sized uh, renewable energy projects or participating in things like social impact bonds. Um, and, and some also some opportunities in terms of retrofitting buildings uh, as well. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we have, um, it's funny, um, questions always take time to kick off and then I receive all of them at the same time. Um, I will invite David to ask you a question. Hi, Adam, you just mentioned two asset classes there, um, the renewables and impact bonds. Just stepping back from listed equities, I mean, what, what are the implications of ethical investing for the top-down portfolio construction, you know, picking your asset classes, the weights that you give to asset classes, and the switches between, you know, from one asset class to another? Mm. Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, I mean, all of the portfolios we run are balanced um, portfolios. Um, and so they're investing across all the asset classes. Um, you know, we have investments in listed equities, uh, fixed interest, uh, which our fixed interest is divided between things like bonds, but also um, credit and debt uh, as well. And then we have alternatives, which is spread mostly across infrastructure type, um, type investments. 
Um, sorry, I've gone a bit blank. Sorry, what was it? Um, and, and in terms of, well, oh, sorry, David, do you mind just asking the question again? <laughs> Yeah, so, so you mentioned, you know, you've got unlisted renewables there, but a lot of the large industry funds and other, uh, you know, pension products have direct uh, infrastructure and renewables. Um, but are there any asset classes that you uh, ethical investors through a superannuation fund? And do you overweight some asset classes or underweight some asset classes that other funds you know typically in um yeah I, you cut out for a little bit while asking the question but uh yeah i think our um for a fund of our size uh we probably invest a lot more into unlisted assets um than what most funds our size do and i think compared to most ethical funds most ethical funds are very heavy into listed equities and don't invest a lot into alternatives and unlisted investments so i think in that way we have an investment approach that looks more like a big industry fund, but without the size of a big industry fund. Uh, and one of the impacts of that is just the amount of opportunities we get access to is based on our size. So if you have a real huge mega project, you're going to go to a Hester or a Host Plus or an Australian Super, you're not going to come to us. You'll come to us if you need, you know, somewhere between five to 20 million um, for your project. So that sort of makes a big difference. It also makes a big difference in terms of what we, um, what we invest in there. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. We have one. We have time for one more question, and then we'll have to wrap up. There's a lot more in the chat, but um, can I invite? Um, yeah, go for it. Hello. Yep. Cool. Hey, Adam. Thanks a lot, man. That's it. This has been a really good, a really good presentation. So I'm I'm in an industry fund. I'm in the ethical uh, portion of that industry fund of course one of the things about that is uh, my industry fund doesn't take a very active approach to its ethical investments uh, definitely not a direct action approach like you're taking i'm wondering though do you see like obviously the my industry has made an ethical option because they want customers to use it right and then they'll want to attract more customers do you see the industry funds actually deciding that the people who are in that ethical fund they'll start taking direct at like voting the shares for example in in that portion to compete with you or do or do you see them just 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 keeping it as as the normal fund is but just you know having this delineation about oh well, we're not going to have any coal or oil or whatever now yeah i think right now most industry funds have a sustainable ethical option to keep their members happy uh, who uh, otherwise would switch and it's a retention exercise. And then they're probably not putting as much effort into that portfolio as they would if they were a dedicated ethical or responsible investment manager. So I think what you would probably get is uh, in that option is some ethical screening and probably not a lot, uh, lot else. I think the engagement in the voting side, the fund is doing that at an entire fund level um, rather than uh, particularly advocating on behalf of the people who have chosen the ethical options who might... Um, sort of have a little bit of a different um, opinion of some of the ethical um, things that need to get voted on at AGMs. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, one of the other tough things with uh, industry funds is that they say that people don't switch options, but equally I've never seen much evidence of them promoting their ethical options to their members. I also think it's a bit strange that they put their ethics into, you know, because super funds talk about ethics quite a bit, but then they have an ethical option. And you think if those ethics are important, then they should be default uh, within their portfolios. It shouldn't be something you need to um, switch to or make an active decision to do. I find it hard to believe that members of industry funds, for instance, would want their money invested in nuclear weapons or tobacco or things like that. I think those are, there are a lot of ethical issues that are very common across, um, across people, uh, whether you are someone who's likely to choose an ethical option or not. And yet the default position of super funds is to say, well, actually, you know, like, um, we're a bit agnostic on it, you know, nuclear weapons is okay, it's fine for most people. Thank you, Adam, there's a stand up. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all what, what we have time for uh, today. Uh, apologies to everyone who had a question and didn't get to ask, I'll, I'll make sure um, I get some answers from Adam uh, later on. Um, thank you so much, Adam, great presentation and um, 
lots. I, I love that we went through so many different aspects from impact um, all the way to financial performance and future trends. Um, I will wrap it with a few closing thoughts, if you don't mind. So I wanted to thank everyone for coming um, today. And, and I want to leave you with just one sentence. Money talks when money walks. I hope you feel fired up after our chat today because it's nice to chat, but it's even nicer to act. Your homework after today will take you five minutes. Have a look at what your super is invested in. And if you don't like what to see, you know what to do. Just write that email and tell them that you want to see some change. Otherwise, you might be taking your savings elsewhere. I'd like to thank you all again for coming today and making the time and commitment to learn and be curious. Well done. If you enjoyed our session today, please invite your friends and colleagues who might also find the content of these webinars and conversations useful. My goal is to make these webinars fun. Um, we talk finance, so it's not always easy, but we can do it. Um, it, has, it has to be useful and accessible. So please send me your feedback. Um, how can I make it better? Let me know. Um, if you have suggestions on speakers and topics, um, please reach out. Make sure you follow us on social media um, as more webinars are scheduled soon. And in fact, I've just confirmed this morning our next speaker. So please join me on the 14th of July. It is Bastille Day. Um, we'll talk about sustainable banking. Um, can our bank accounts save the world? Big program. And um, I will have the pleasure to invite Jane Kern, who is a senior manager um, at Impact, um, sorry, Senior Manager Impact Finance um, at Bank Australia. So we'll be talking about um, finance and impact. Adam, thank you so much. Do you want to say a final word or? Um, no, it's, it's, it's great advice to go out and check out where your super currently is. Um, mm. And then um, in the letter, give them a hard time when you find out it's invested in things you don't like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, I look forward to um, seeing you all again mid-July. And until then, take care, um, be well, and, um, and yeah, I hope to see you next time.